Hello and welcome back to the channel. Today we are having a little listening party and I'm joined with Jordan and Josh. Jordan is the creator of the Soundscape of Time. Oh, you have a special guest as well. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> and I'm going to kick it over to Jordan first because people who are joining us now, they might know nothing about the Soundscape of Time. So if you want to introduce yourself and talk about it a little bit. Yeah, definitely. So the soundscape of time is, I'm super hyped about it. I took the audiobooks, uh, well, the first audiobook so far for the Wheel of Time, and I've created an immersive audio accompaniment to that. So original sound effects, ambient environments, a score, all this kind of stuff for each moment of the whole 30 hours of, of the first book. And I plan on doing the whole series. Um, and I did a Kickstarter, which was really awesome. And uh, I got a, the first four books funded at least. So uh, that's really awesome. And uh, yeah, it's basically an audio accompaniment to the whole thing. So instead of just listening to the audiobook, you'll hear, you know, the horses moving, you'll hear music, you'll hear the wind and the trees and all that kind of stuff for the whole journey, which is really cool. Um, but it also has the benefit of not being a uh, adapted version. It's not abridged in any way. It's the full book. Uh, so the full text with uh, sound effects and everything like that for the whole, the whole journey. So it's really exciting. And we'll get to hear some uh, a little bit later. Yeah, I want to kick it over to Josh now. Josh is Josh is a regular staple here at the Rhodes <laughs> Tarval, and I feel like he needs no introduction, but <laughs> Josh, introduce yourself, and have you have you heard any? You've heard some of these. I, I have heard some. I have been I have been blessed to hear some samples and uh, even further blessed uh, to, with permission, share those samples with uh, Kate Redding and Michael Kramer. Um, and I, I will never, for, uh, Jordan, really, the only, the only uh, regret I have in that experience is that you weren't there to see Michael Kramer's face when he yeah. listened to, he was, he, first off, he was captivated. Okay. The whole time he listened to, I, I think you had sent me a longer sample yeah. and I was like, you don't have to listen to the whole thing. You know, it's just a, you know, to get an idea. And he, he had my phone up to his head like this was just he was his eyes were closed he was captivated and he just you know and then when he when he when he got done and he looked at me and went <laughs> yes <laughs> and, and and i i'm just so sad you didn't get to see it because it was such a beautiful expression such a beautiful moment and i you know i've always loved your your soundscape uh uh work here and that that like I felt like a part of it and I was very very uh grateful for that experience and I love this and I'm super excited to be here today. <laughs> awesome. My, so for people who don't know Michael and Kate are the audiobook narrators for the Wheel of Time but I mean they they endorsed this project they were tweeting about it also yeah. so yeah. if you know if you don't want to take my word for it <laughs> take Michael and Kate so, yeah. and I will yeah. I will quickly uh, just throw in here just to clarify <laughs> so everyone knows the audiobook is not included in the soundscape. That's kind right. of really important to mention. Uh, you can really easily put the two of them together. It's like a two step process, and then you have the combined thing. Uh, but it's important to say that they're not included. But that means that there's also this added experience where you can just listen to the soundscape on its own without the narration. And you can feel like you're going through all these events and going through the story, just hearing it all instead of having the narration. So uh, for people that know the story well, uh, you'll recognize moments along the way, which is just another fun way of experiencing it for sure. Yeah. When we were going through the different moments that we were picking to, to, to share today, I was out that morning walking my dog and it brings a whole different level to the audiobooks. If you are someone who enjoys audiobooks, and I do because I'm up every morning at the crack of dawn, <laughs> getting my dog out the door, going on, you know, 30 minute to an hour walk with him. This 
is such a different experience than just the plain audiobooks. And I mean, the audiobooks themselves alone, there's so much heart and feeling. The The narrators are incredible. I have such a soft spot for the narrators, but listening to it with the soundscape is truly something different. And from, you know, like the big height, like big battle moments to like the very sad moments, <laughs> I feel like I was a lot more affected in both ways but I think we've got a good selection like some some pretty hype things happening some kind of sad moments quiet moments but I'm just I'm really excited because I think this will probably be the first time that people out there who haven't bought it can actually get like a little taste and so yeah, if yeah. you are listening if you're here with us I would definitely recommend putting on good headphones or earbuds just so that you can really hear what's going on yeah uh, the whole thing is mixed with Dolby Atmos so there's 3D movement and things like that happening. And this is a good chance actually for me to mention that I've only recently, through a ton of problem solving and things like that, discovered a new way to kind of present the soundscape to everybody. So when you get it, you can listen to it on your on a private podcast feed. And I've figured out a way that I can actually upload my files to that so that you can listen to it on headphones, but you can also have it play properly through a soundbar, through a 7.1 setup or anything like that. So it'll actually decode properly to any of those setups for you. The headphones experience is always going to be the kind of optimal version, but uh, it's very exciting that it can now, you know, if you have a full surround setup, it'll just do its thing and play properly through that as well. So... Should we listen to our first segment? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Sounds Do you want to prep good. us and tell us what we're listening to here? Yeah, so this is, this first one is actually going to be from the very end of the prologue. So we're going to get, uh, we just had Dragon Mount form, and we're going to get our little outro prophecy from that chapter. And the shadow fell upon the land, and the world was riven stone from stone. The oceans fled, and the mountains were swallowed up, and the nations were scattered to the eight corners of the world. The moon was as blood, and the sun was as ashes. The seas boiled, and the living envied the dead. All was shattered, and all but memory lost, and one memory above all others, of him who brought the shadow and the breaking of the world and him they named Dragon. From Aleth Nin Terin Alta Camora, The Breaking of the World. Author unknown, The Fourth Age. And it came to pass in those days, as it had come before and would come again, that the dark lay heavy on the land and weighed down the hearts of men, and the green things failed and hope died. And men cried out to the Creator, saying, O light of the heavens, light of the world, let the promised one be born of the mountain, according to the prophecies, as he was in ages past, and will be in ages to come. Let the prince of the morning sing to the land that green things will grow and the valleys give forth lambs. Let the arm of the Lord of the dawn shelter us from the dark, and the great sword of justice defend us. Let the dragon ride again on the winds of time. From Charal Drianan Te Kalaman, The Cycle of the Dragon. Author unknown, The Fourth Age. I'm going to cut to Josh. <laughs> Your face is, I see a lot of feels in the face. <laughs> Look, first and foremost, I, I love, um, I love their reading. I do. I went through the audiobooks for the first time, like shortly after uh, a memory of light came out and it was, and I've done, you know, the, 
the readings of the first book you know the first book we've all read like 18 times and the last three books we've read like three times but you know the because that's you know how it goes um and then i went i'll never forget you know a new a memory of light came out and the whole series was complete and i was like i have to go through the whole series just one continuous read and i did and then shortly after that um you know, I realized, oh my gosh, there's audiobooks. And I went through the whole thing in audiobooks, and it was just amazing hearing that. And I, I feel like just listening to that right there, this makes me feel like there's a new echelon of the Wheel of Time that I'm going to have to go through the entire series with because of how much dimension how much flavor is added just just with i mean even in this case like not to like you know make small your work because your works are mighty <laughs> but even when you've got a simple sort of just like a music even just a soft singing in the background just something to to engage more of of the brain synapse there it's mm -hmm. It's amazing. I love it. And this, this particularly um, was fantastic. It's, it's absolutely amazing. I am someone who like, I don't always see in my head when I'm reading or listening to an audiobook. Like I don't, I, I don't always have a good like way to like picture things as it's happening, but I've noticed when I'm listening to it with the soundscape, I do tend to get more of that like cinematic, like I, I see things clear, I guess, in my, in my head, if that makes yeah, sense. Totally. Yeah. It, it feels so much more cinematic. Like it feels like you're sitting in a movie theater and you're just kind of getting like yeah. walloped with sound around <laughs> you. <laughs> Except the movie is 30 hours long, um, which is awesome. And that's, that's exactly how I feel as well. This like, um, oh, did we freeze? with blue slashes across her bodice and skirts <laughs> divided for writing and teardrop sunflowers coming across. And it's just like, <sighs> naive to me, reading the books was person with a braid. Like, I don't yeah, yeah. you a lot. A, a trait a physical trait and it's literally my brain is like okay there's a fist holding a braid and just jerking the braid and that's, <laughs> I need. that's because it's a simple icon that i can remember and i like um what you were saying amber about just having that audio track in the background makes that easier to sort of envision or or to imagine and i yeah it it's it's true it is you, you go oh okay and and you it i i really do feel like it's like more of the brain is stimulated at that point in time for any neurologist listening along you know tell me <laughs> i'm wrong or right <laughs> but i feel like <laughs> because more of the brain is engaged it gives us the better ability to focus and the better ability to see what's happening yeah and there's also i mean that like subconscious audio clue of like how I should be feeling in this moment. Very awesome. Should we go on to our second clip? Yeah. What do we yes, got? Please. <laughs> this is a totally different mood. <laughs> so we are going to chapter 14, skipping a bunch of chapters. Um, and this is one of one of the first dreams that Rand has. Um, <laughs> Spoilers, by the way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in um, case, you know, but Al Zaman is here. He's in the room yeah. with us. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right. You think you are safe from me in your dreams? Look! Baal Zaman pointed commandingly, and Rand's head turned to follow, although he did not turn it. He did not want to turn. The goblet was gone from the table. Where it had been, crouched a large rat, blinking at the light, sniffing the air warily. Balsamon crooked his finger, and with a squeak, the rat arched its back, forepaws lifting into the air while it balanced awkwardly on its hind feet. The finger curved more, and the rat toppled over, scrabbling frantically, pawing at nothing, squealing shrilly, its back bending, bending, bending. 
With a sharp snap, like the breaking of a twig, the rat trembled violently and was still, lying bent almost double. Rand swallowed. Anything can happen in a dream, he mumbled. Without looking, he swung his fist back against the door again. His hand hurt, but he still did not wake up. Then go to the eye, said I. Go to the White Tower and tell them. Tell the Amarlin seat of this dream. The man laughed. Rand felt the heat of the flames on his face. That is one way to escape them. They will not use you then. No, not when they know that I know. But will they let you live to spread the tale of what they do? Are you a big enough fool to believe they will? The ashes of many like you are scattered on the slopes of Dragon Mount. This is a dream, Rand said, panting. It's a dream, and I'm going to wake up. Will you? Out of the corner of his eye, he saw the man's finger move to point at him. Will you indeed? The finger crooked, and Rand screamed as he arched backwards, every muscle in his body forcing him further. Will you ever wake? I think my yeah yeah I forgot how much animal abuse is in these books <laughs> what I wanted to say though is the first thing that I can pick out in this segment is the percussion in it sounds like a heartbeat which makes it feel really claustrophobic like you feel like Rand just really like He's not in a good place. Backed <laughs> yeah. into that corner. <laughs> yeah, he's really backed into that corner. And I've already had more ideas for what the future holds with dream scenarios and, and being really close into some of these characters' perspectives. Uh, I think that it's going to be really a lot of fun. But it also, moments like this really show um, the kind of visceral nature of some of the scenes that, again, might not fully translate um, if you're just reading or if you're just listening to the audiobook. So as brutal as it is to put those sounds in there, um, it yeah. really, really brings it to life. Uh, yeah, because that's the nature of the books. I mean, a lot of people, I think a lot of people place the Wheel of Time into this very light kind of um, like whimsical, nostalgic place. Where it's like, you know, like a like a young adult could read it. It's fine. There are a lot of undertones of some very dark things in this series that I think a lot of people forget about. And this is definitely reminding me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I was just gonna I was just gonna say, because my first thought as soon as I started hearing that rat squeak, because I was like, oh no, are we gonna hear the snap? And then we did, and I was like, oh, that was just <laughs> <laughs> oh so creepy and perfect and and then i started just kind of where you were going with that amber was you know there are some really dark and scary things in this sorry in this in these books and whew, audio is good jordan i gotta just ask you like is is it a challenge to kind of say i can't go that deep <laughs> is there is there a challenge <laughs> like to keep it lighthearted or, or not lighthearted but to not go as deep or are you just like are you just gonna like full-on dive in and embrace it i think that uh it'll be a kind of a case-to-case -case kind of thing where i okay uh, kind of the same way that you would if you were making a show of it. You kind of have to decide. And and the, the nice thing, too, is that I always have the music as a way of not doing all the specific sound effects if I don't want to, right? The music can right. take over and, and kind of play that emotion instead if I want. Um, but I always go into all of the soundscapes as... Like, what would you hear? What would they actually hear? And then I kind of choose based off of that what to kind of showcase. There's a good example in um, 
in the first chapter, not the prologue, the first chapter where there's a couple uh, moments where we are described some some singing and stuff going on in, in Emmons Field. Um, but the kind of music for Emmons Field had just kicked in at that point. So I kind of decided to lean onto the music instead of uh, the real world sound there. So kind of it kind of goes back and forth. Um, like a movie would, you know, movie. Yeah, like selects like ratings. what you want to hear. Yeah, Yeah. like ratings. How how far do you want to go? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Should we I love it. jump to our our next selection? Yeah, this is in chapter 18, Camelin Road, and we get a little bit of a, uh, this is one of your choices, Amber. This is, uh, well, it kind of speaks for itself, but we're we're on the run. We're on the Yeah. run. The line of Trollocs scrambled forward. Even before the Murdral moved, Lan's sword was in his hand. Stay with me, he cried, and Mondar plunged down the slope toward the Trollocs. For the Seven Towers, he shouted. Rand gulped and booted the grave forward. The whole group of them streamed after the warder. He was surprised to find Tam's sword in his fist. Caught up by Lan's cry, he found his own. Manetherin! Manetherin! Perrin took it up. Manetherin! Manetherin! But Matt shouted, Karayan Kaldazar! Karayan Alessandra! Al Alessandra! The Matt's head turned from the Trollocs to the riders charging toward him. The black sword froze over its head, and the opening of its cowl swiveled, searching among the oncoming horsemen. Then Lan was on the Murdral as the human folk fell on the Trolloc line. Warder's blade met black steel from the forges of Thakandar with a clang like a great bell, the toll echoing in the hollow, a flash of blue light filling the air like sheet lightning. Beast-muzzled, almost men, swarmed around each of the humans, catch poles and hooks flailing. Only Lan and the Murdral did they avoid. Those two fought in a clear circle, black horses matching step for step, swords matching stroke for stroke. The air flashed and peeled. Cloud rolled his eyes and screamed, rearing and lashing out with his hooves at the snarling, sharp-toothed faces surrounding him. Heavy bodies crowded shoulder to shoulder around him. Digging his heels in ruthlessly, Rand forced the Grey on regardless, swinging his sword with little of the skill Lan had tried to impart, hacking as if hewing wood. Egwene. Desperately, he searched for her as he kicked the Grey onward, slashing a path through the hairy bodies as though chopping undergrowth. Moraine's white mare dashed and cut at the slightest touch of the Aes Sedai's hands on the reins. Her face was as hard as Lan's as her staff lashed out. Hard I to love stop that that one. so much. <laughs> I love that so much. You, you, you can't describe it. it. It's, it is indescribable. Um, it just is. It, you have to, you have to listen to it. But when the sword clangs were like over here, ting, 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 ting. And I was just like, this is a battle being fought all around me right now. I'm sitting Mm here -hmm. and I can hear. And this It's book just like doesn't you were even saying. have this book doesn't even have full battles yet, you know? Not yeah. That's true. So some stuff I mean, to it's, come in that department. <laughs> yeah, this, I mean, technically this is kind of a, like a skirmish compared to what we get later in the series, but with this moment, there's so much happening. I, I want to ask you about the Trolloc howls and what you kind of use to come up with this noise because it's very specific. Did he tell Yeah. you to ask this? Did he tell No, you to ask this? no, no, no. no. <laughs> I was curious Is it you? when it would come Is up. it Josh? No, uh, I was, I, so when we were at Jordan con and I wanted people to give us their best Trolloc impressions, I was going to send him all the audio files and have me, and I procrastinated and ADHD the hell out of life. And There's 13 more books worth to get this. Yes. And, and I will get those to you and probably when you're done. <laughs> there's a yeah right when i release memory of light that's when i'm gonna go <laughs> um, Yeah. <laughs> hey, I got it for you, buddy. <laughs> so yeah the trollocs are uh i have some kind of quote-unquote monster sounds um but really there's a lot of like combining those sounds with animal sounds 
um, because that's how it's described a lot of the time. You have like goat looking men and things like that. Um, so, and it's, it was really interesting to try and separate because I've done all of Lord of the Rings. So to try and make them not sound like orcs because they're very different types of creatures. Um, so the orcs were all very human based. People sent in recordings of those, but the Trollocs are a lot more animally sounding. Um, but yeah, using some of the software that I have that kind of confuse uh, two sounds together to get something new. Um, so that was, that was a, uh, I was trying to keep a lot of the monster sounds so far in, in book one, very animal based, like the, the drag car is a, is a very slowed down bat sound. Um, so when we hear it scream in the, in the, in oh, the, I should have picked the drag you know. car <laughs> moment. <laughs> yeah. So that, that was really fun, but yeah, trying to keep them all closer to animal type sounds and just, just. I mean, Winter Night especially is the one where we get introduced to all of these uh, these sounds, and it's really meant to be like, you know, Rand's perspective of like, what the heck are these things? Um, and I think that that, you know, I feel like as a comparison with the orcs, you can you can be like, oh, these used to be elves or whatnot, and and they're humanoids still, but the Trollocs are like. I don't know what's going on here. And I wanted the sounds to, to kind of <laughs> emulate that. <laughs> so. so if someone's listening and they think that they can do a really great trollic impression, how do they, how, how do they get the chance to use that? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, trollocs especially are the thing that I always will need more sounds for. So yeah. if you want, if you want to send some in, then <laughs> just go to my website and, and send well, me an email. Maybe... <laughs> Maybe at next Jordan Con, I'll collect more yeah, trolley. It'll questions. just be like a yearly thing. It'll be we'll yeah. <laughs> one. And, then, and then, then I'll, and then them. I'll give them all. <laughs> yeah, it's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, what would be a really cool idea is getting like everyone outside and setting up microphones and getting like group screams and yells and battle cries. That could be kind of cool. You know, I, I did that kind of thing for Lord of the Rings. Um, did you? Yeah. In, in the first chapter where Bilbo gives his speech. I was at a, a a moot a conference for Tolkien, and we got we got someone up on stage to do the speech, and he would pause, and then people would do the reaction, and I recorded that, and then he would do the next part, and they'd do the reaction, and that's in the soundscape exactly as we recorded. Oh, it. that's so, so cool! Uh, yeah, this kind of thing, though. I mean, like we were saying earlier, the bigger battles need people, so. Uh, I'll definitely be looking for these kind of events to record some some things like that. So it's exciting. Ooh. So should we jump to our next selection? Yeah, this one is heavy. Oh no, I, I know what it is. <laughs> yeah. Oh, <no. laughs> yeah, I almost think I shouldn't describe what it is because just just let's just go in raw. Just go right into it. Yeah. Get your tissues ready. Mm -hmm. Oh no. No! It was not at the horseman, he shouted. Out of the night, Hopper came, and Perrin was one with the wolf. Hopper, the cub who had watched the eagles soar and wanted so badly to fly through the sky as the eagles did. The cub who hopped and jumped and leaped until they could leap higher than any other wolf, and who never lost the cub's yearning to soar through the sky. Out of the night, Hopper came and left the ground in a leap, soaring like the eagles. The White Cloaks had only a moment to begin cursing before Hopper's jaws closed in the throat of the man with his lance leveled at Perrin. The big wolf's momentum carried them both off the other side of the horse. Perrin felt the throat crushing, tasted the blood. Hopper landed lightly, already apart from the man he had killed. Blood matted his fur, his own blood and that of others. A gash down his face crossed the empty socket where his left eye had been. His good eye met Perrin's too for just an instant. Run, brother. He whirled to leap again, to soar one last time. And a lance pinned him to the earth. A second length of steel thrust through his ribs, driving into the ground under him. Kicking, he snapped at the shafts that held him. To soar. Pain filled Perrin, and he screamed. A wordless scream that had something of a wolf's cry in it. Without thinking, he leaped forward, still screaming. 
All thought was gone. The horsemen had bunched too much to be able to use their lances, and the axe was a feather in his hands. One huge wolf's tooth of steel. Something crashed into his head, and as he fell, he did not know if it was Hopper or himself who died. Does it gets me every time? Gets me every time. <laughs> Still gets me, <laughs> and I've listened to it <laughs> so many times. You know, this scene reminds me of a song called "She Bled." It's written by a gentleman by the name of Rodney Brannigan, and uh, he he did a local sort of circuit and then toured a bunch of colleges in the UK, and and it was about a song. It was a song about a dog you know being beaten to death it was super sad and every every single time he would sing it and perform it he'd be like look i'm sorry i <laughs> i wrote the song because i was in my feels and it, and it was just that that scene just i i was immediately transported back mm -hmm. to dante's cafe in amarillo texas where i listened to that song so thank you for that <laughs> <laughs> oh sorry <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's, I mean, this is the reality. Like we talked about it. This it really is the reality of this series. I mean, that's, this isn't the only moment that's going to get people in the feels, I yeah. think, but it, I think it is important to show because, you know, it's, we've got a lot of highs and lows that we got to work through yeah. here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, uh, and again, like that moment, is like the whole moment start to finish and it was like two minutes long so when you think about that that's why it was so hard to choose moments yeah. because there's little things like that throughout the whole thing uh you know every chapter has something uh or multiple moments to kind of look forward to or dread i guess if you want to look at it that way yeah but we definitely took our time to select things that were on different ranges so it wasn't just all you know battles or etc yeah. well and this is this is you know this this ties perfectly into the question we just asked of how deep are we going how dark are you going yeah. like what are you and and i think you just illustrated perfectly you know I, I think I think I think the mission would be to be as true to the story as you possibly can, and I think you're doing a great job of that. Thank you. I, I really yeah. Yeah. this this scene was very well illustrated for that moment. And it's it's interesting because you get the ability to do things that like a show or a movie can't do, where all this description is happening, you know. Of what, yeah parents feeling and and we have all that time to kind of really feel it and having um, the the yells that I put in there was kind of a late addition um, and uh, I'm so happy I went with that because it really because I was trying to portray that the moment kind of slows down almost um, and there's I was just listening to book four the other day and there's a moment where that kind of thing happens as well with Matt, uh, where time really slows down. And I was like, oh, I'm so excited to to handle moments like that, you know, because I just think that it's something that I can do in a way that a movie or a show doesn't have the time to do necessarily. So Yeah. Yeah. And I think too, I think that the soundscape is really it's a really nice thing. I think anybody who likes the audiobooks would really like this. And I mean, I think I, mm -hmm. I, especially this se most recent season of the wheel of time, I liked it quite a bit. I think Josh is a little bit more lukewarm than I am. <laughs> I know Jordan really enjoyed it, but I think despite where you stand, like on the TV show, the, the audiobooks with the soundscape, I think fills a void for like anyone who might have interest in the books or the show, like the, the crossover factor, I think you it's get... anything for, it's for anyone. Yeah. Cause you get, um, you, you kind of get the show movie experience, but with the mm -hmm. actual, 
I, I say actual, but with the, the real full story, you know, so if, <clears throat> if watching the show and, and missing parts of the books are, is bugging you, then maybe this is a better way to experience it. Um, because it's yeah. all there. Yeah, exactly. You've got it all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. On Let's to our go. next one. Yes. On the next. This is uh, an exciting one because we are switching narrators. This is Kate reading, and we are with Nynaeve. The pale tents were only 30 yards off, and she could see men moving among them. If they noticed the horses stirring and came to see what caused it, desperately she wished for Moiraine not to wait on her return. Whatever the eyes Sedai was going to do, let her do it now. Light, make her do it now before... Abruptly, lightning shattered the night overhead for a moment obliterating darkness. Thunder smote her ears so hard she thought her knees would buckle as a jagged trident stabbed the ground just beyond the horses, splashing dirt and rocks like a fountain. The crash of riven earth fought the thunderstroke. The horses went mad, screaming and rearing. The picket ropes snapped like thread where she had cut them. Another lightning bolt sliced down before the image of the first faded. Nynaeve was too busy to exult. At the first clash, Bella jerked one way while the other horse reared away in the opposite direction. She thought her arms were being pulled out of their sockets. For an endless minute, she hung suspended between the horses, her feet off the ground, her scream flattened by the second crash. Again the lightning struck, and again and again, in one continuous raging roar from the heavens. Balked in the way they wanted to go, the horses surged back, letting her drop. She wanted to crouch on the ground and soothe her tortured shoulders, but there was no time. Bella and the other horse buffeted her, eyes rolling wildly till only whites showed, threatening to knock her down and trap her. Somehow she made her arms lift, clutched her hands in Bella's mane, pulled herself onto the heaving mare's back. The other rein was still around her wrist, pulled tight into the flesh. Her jaw dropped as a long gray shadow snarled past, seeming to ignore her and the horses with her, but teeth snapping at the crazed animals now darting in every direction. A second shadow of death followed close behind her. Nynaeve wanted to scream again, but nothing came out. Wolves? Might help us. What is Moiraine doing? The heels she dug into Bella's sides were not needed. The mare ran, and the other was more than happy to follow. Anywhere, so long as they could run, so long as they could escape the fire from the sky that killed the night. So this is Nynaeve freeing the horses outside of the White Cloak camp. Mm -hmm. And... Josh, I could see in your face you had a lot, <laughs> you had a lot, a lot of facial movements. <laughs> look, look, I oh, I love this scene because it, it's one of those. It, uh, Nynaeve as a character is a very <laughs> big character. Let's say she's yeah. a very big character, and I don't mean page time. I mean personality wise, and and. I love that she is doing her best. You know, she's going there, she's cutting lines and she notices Bella and she's like, no way I'm leaving Bella here. I need to do this and this and this. And she's, she, she is in the wrong. I mean, she's going off script and she immediately starts. Well, I hope Moraine doesn't wait for me to get back. <laughs> I hope that she knows to just go ahead with the plan because yeah. I'm capable of taking care of my you know, as she's like starting to like <laughs> go against the plan and and start, you know, justifying why she's right for that, mm -hmm. the thunder and lightning hit and she just Gah! like, yeah. <laughs> and I got that moment in the book, in, in the soundscape where it was just like <clears throat> this huge clap of thunder. And I'm like, oh, that's it. End it's of like thought. It, it yeah, was it's like Moraine having the last laugh, but then <laughs> Nynaeve, of course, at the end, twists it around because she hears the wolves and she's like, "Wolves, what is Moraine doing?" Right. <laughs> it's, it's like, oh, that, we that always have so to blame Moraine. 
<laughs> Marine's <laughs> fault for everything. Yes. Yes. No, but that but that thunderclap just oh god, it was great. It was just yeah. Great. And uh, this is probably a good moment to to quickly share that um, another kind of little added bonus about how the soundscapes are kind of presented, I guess, is like in my versions that I listen to, so what we just listened to there, I like the soundscape to be <laughs> a little bit higher, but because they aren't included, you can decide like if you want the sound effects and stuff a little bit quieter, you can mix it that way if you want it a little bit louder you can do that as well so there's kind of room to play around there um, but yeah, i like you can the, really the epic tinker with it to, <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah that one was a lot of fun so what do we have next um i think we have a quieter moment Ooh, chapter 41 okay. do you want to tell us about old friends and new threats is this in the inn or is this so this is the 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 reunification i believe of rand and matt have been off on their own they're at the queen's blessing in camelin and rand just hears about a stranger who showed up in the inn and yeah cool this is a oh, this, this is a quick cool. one but it's nice in five minutes master gill sighed she will be telling the other women you're a prince in disguise by nightfall it will be all over the new city master gill Rand said. I never mentioned Matt to Elaine. It can't be. Suddenly a huge smile lit up his face and he ran for the kitchens. Wait, the innkeeper called behind him. Wait until you know. Wait, you fool. Rand threw open the door to the kitchens and there they were. Moraine rested her serene eyes on him, unsurprised. Nynaeve and Egwene ran laughing to throw their arms around him, with Perrin crowding in behind them. All three patting his shoulders as if they had to be convinced that he was really there. In the doorway leading to the stable yard, Lan lounged with one boot up on the door frame, dividing his attention between the kitchen and the yard outside. Rand tried to hug the two women and shake Perrin's hand all at the same time. And it was a tangle of arms and laughter, complicated by Nynaeve trying to feel his face for fever. They looked somewhat the worse for wear, bruises on Perrin's face, and he had a way of keeping his eyes downcast that he had never had before. But they were alive and together again. That one just makes me so happy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, same. I just said, that's such a good scene. It is. And I think, too, what what I really loved about this segment, I, I, I chose it. Obviously, I really liked it. <laughs> but... That noise when he meets eyes with Moraine. Rand and Moraine have such a tumultuous relationship through the series. And it's really something when we get just one moment, at least one moment where Rand is legitimately 1000% so relieved to see this woman. And the almost like celestial like noise in the background like it's just so more rain <laughs> like <laughs> it's just so her she's just this larger than life figure and I think the the music behind her in that moment really just I'm like yeah that's that's her that's her yeah and one of the things that is really fun to play with in the soundscape is we have these themes for all these characters and things like that that I've written and you know a good example is when we're with when we're with Matt and Rand we're with them for a while um, and we don't we're not back with the others uh, for you know multiple hours worth of audio time at, at points and so it seems like like we have these themes and we kind of we lose them for a while for like a movie a movie's length of time and so as an example that that vocal part that came in there and especially the guitar which is um playing a slowed down version of it, the emmons field theme um like we haven't heard especially with with matt being kind of in the state that he is uh, we haven't heard any of that kind of warmth in a while and so it's really these kind of long form payoffs that are nice to to be able to get in the series and then there's little 
you know, musical cues that I've planted that hopefully will pay off in books to come, you know, things like that. And, Yeah, you know, little Easter exciting. eggs here and there, too, from Yeah. <laughs> what we've talked about. Before we jump into something like that, and before we jump into the next segment, I do want to say that if you're still here, still listening, still watching, I will link Josh's channel below, his two channels, but I will also link Jordan's information where you can find him, his YouTube channel, and how to get in touch. And also, <laughs> you were pointing and I'm literally looking like, what, what? <laughs> but, but also, <laughs> I thought maybe there was someone behind me. <laughs> but also, please give this video a like and a share if you know somebody within the Wheel of Time community who might be interested in the soundscapes. So, yeah. And I will say really quickly, just to add on to that, um, you can, of course, buy the, the first book on my website now, um, but you can also still add late pledge to the Kickstarter. And I'm actually very close um, to hitting uh, book five uh, as an included in the, in the Kickstarter kind of thing. So check that out um, if you're interested. We can post links to all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. Book five, you know, you need that. You need that Val and Luca circus music in the background. <laughs> Don't be shy. I know. I want I know some calliope going. All right. I know there are 10 of us who are really waiting for that. <laughs> Me That's included. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. All right. This next one is also one that you chose, Amber. Ooh. This is chapter 50. So this is the green man taking out Bathalmel, Bathalmel, Bathalmel. That's a One of tongue those. twister. Yeah, for sure. but, yeah. That's a <laughs> Right? I'm not a purist in the pronunciation. Um, this is the green man going ham, killing some forsaken, and then uh, a nice kind of beautiful moment afterwards. Just a really quick funny side note. <laughs> in in one of the f it might even be chapter one but it might be chapter two michael pronounces aginor instead of aginor which to me is so like a funny meta thing because if you're in rand's pov he wouldn't have any idea how to pronounce some of these names you know yeah so it's just like funny for me to think of it through that lens where it's like because the pronunciations change a little bit through the audiobooks but like if you just think about it as like whose POV you're in, then it all, it's fine. Yeah. It's all good. <laughs> yeah. They don't, who, yeah. Like Mo Gideon, Mo Gideon. like the, the two people might not know the name. Yeah. So and yeah. <laughs> they have also come out. They've been actually pretty um, public about, you know, Hey, pronunciations are funny. And uh, I believe if you look up hashtag Muggy Dean, M-U-G-G-Y-D-E-A-N, it's it's a tweet from Kate and Michael Credit. Kate and Michael, where they're just like, look, you do your best. And even even Robert Jordan wasn't consistent on some of the pronunciations. So just, yeah. yeah, it's not worth getting hung up on, in my opinion. <laughs> Don't get pressed. So, all right, so chapter 50, back to this. Swelling to cover the length of it. Balthamo thrashed, and a shoot of stinkweed ripped open his carapace. Lichens dug in their roots and split tiny cracks across the leather of his face. Nettles broke the eyes of his mask. Death's head mushrooms tore open the mouth. The green man threw the forsaken down. Balthamo twisted and jerked as all the things that grew in the dark places, all the things with spores, all the things that loved the dank, swelled and grew, tore cloth and leather and flesh. Was it flesh, seen in that brief moment of verdant rage? to tattered shreds and covered him until only a mound remained, indistinguishable from many in the shaded depths of the green forest. And the mound moved no more than they. With a groan like a limb breaking under too great a weight, the green man crashed to the ground. Half his head was charred black. Tendrils of smoke still rose from him like gray creepers. Burned leaves fell from his arm as he painfully stretched out his blackened hand to gently cup an acorn. The earth rumbled as an oak seedling pushed up between his fingers. The green man's head fell, but the seedling reached for the sun, straining. Roots shot out and thickened, delved beneath the ground and rose again, thickened more as they sank. 
The trunk broadened and stretched upward, bark turning gray and fissured and ancient. Limbs spread and grew heavy, as big as arms, as big as men, and lifted to caress the sky, thick with green leaves, dense with acorns. The massive web of roots turned the earth like plows as it spread. The already huge trunk shivered, grew wider, round as a house. Stillness came, and an oak that could have stood 500 years covered the spot where the green man had been, marking the tomb of a legend. Nynaeve lay on the gnarled roots, grown curved to her shape, to make a bed for her to rest upon. The wind sighed through the oak's branches. It seemed to murmur farewell. Even Agenor seemed stunned. Then his head lifted, cavernous eyes burning with hate. Enough! I love this so much because you go through like the battle of it all, like the intensity of the green man just he, he's basically in his death throes you know like he got that last like one two punch in and his dying act is growing something beautiful in the way that he, it's talking about like the the roots kind of like cupping naive gently and it, oh it's just so much <laughs> <laughs> i love it it's funny listening to that because the the book is so long that there's moments like that where I'm like, oh yeah, that's what I what I did for that scene, literally, because it's been, you know, I've, I've like hours since I've listened to it. So uh, it's fun. It's fun to still be able to kind of revisit it and uh, almost hear it, it's, almost hear it fresh. <laughs> yeah, it's such a tonal shift. Like, mm -hmm. and I I love how it just it rips you right into the next feeling. Mm -hmm. This is a good. This is a really great uh, scene that as you're, Amber, what you were talking about, just ripping you from one feeling to the next, that sort of whiplash, that roller coaster. Um, because we talk about, you know, the, the dark horror sort of themes and we talk about the sad themes, um, but we don't talk a lot about the transitions between those scenes, transitions between those emotions, because we really did just go from a victorious bad ass fight where Someshta comes out and he's just like Allah! He pokes his fingers into this guy grows a bunch of deadly plants out of him kills him and we're like yes oh no <laughs> oh no and and Someshta like and thus passes a and and in the books themselves we get a really great sense of you know, the world is a darker place without the Nim, and that was the last, and, but but we don't really have a lot of context at this point in the story for who this guy was. We just feel very sad, and for you to take that and go from that battle into that sadness and just just that smooth transition was just, it, it gives so much more to it, and I love yeah. it. <laughs> and that, that like makes me think about, um, one thing that I get to play around with and what the soundscape I think really shows is the kind of large, as well as these small moments, the kind of large form arcing that goes through where <clears throat> you have all of this crazy dark stuff that happens with shadows waiting and in Shatter Logoth and stuff like that. And it makes the scene, especially with the soundscape where Perrin and Egwene are you know, in the wilderness, walking quietly, it makes scenes like that stand out so much more uh, to the listener, I think, because it's like, it's like, wow, I really needed this after all that, you know, crazy stuff with the Trollocs and stuff like that. So it makes those moments stand out even more and really makes you aware of the flow of the book and how well it is a paced in that way. Um, it's really interesting to see those that shape come to life for sure. Yeah, it's like it's like after um after this battle you get like the intensity to the sadness of the last green man dying to like the mirth and uplifting moment of him creating something beautiful in the very end and it's mm -hmm. just 
Oh, what a transition. It's, <laughs> it's really nice. It's really nice. Before we go any further and move to our kind of uh, climax here, the, the pinnacle segment, <laughs> yeah. I just want to remind everybody again, please like, please subscribe, and please check out Jordan and Josh's channels respectively. And thanks for hanging out with us. Mm -hmm. And I think this last one was Josh's pick. It was. It, it is, and look, I'm, I'm, I know I'm a basic <laughs> bitch, and I don't care. That's just that's who I am as a person. It defines me, and you can like it or not. Yeah, okay. and I think since this is our last segment, this is going to play us out. So, if you guys have anything you want to add before we play this last segment and wrap things up, I, I do want to ask one final question to Jordan. Uh oh. Which conventions are we going to see you at in 2025? That's a good question. I uh, now that Eye of the World is released, I want to be at as many of them as I can um, to show and share and and hopefully do demonstrations of the soundscape. So uh, I'm not 100% sure yet, but the answer is definitely as many as I can, <laughs> as many are, as are kind of close enough to, to get to. Um, so yeah, we'll see, but, uh, I'm going to, uh, once January comes, I'm going to start planning, uh, to be at all of them that I can. And what I've done in the past with Tolkien conferences is, you know, I'll set up the room and do a full demonstration through the speakers and, uh, have people do readings live and stuff like that. So if I'm super lucky, you know, maybe a uh, certain two people will be uh, willing to read with the soundscape live. That would be really, really awesome. Ooh. We'll see. So, so I have one last final question myself. <laughs> Is there maybe one Easter egg that you can tell us about? Maybe something that people wouldn't quite <laughs> notice off the bat within the soundscape. I definitely can. Something that musically, um, that, I don't know. I don't know if, like, if you put this together, I would be amazed probably. Um, and just give you the reins of the soundscape instead, because you're more aware than <laughs> I am. But, uh, <clears throat> and this is the kind of long form stuff that I, I just think is so much fun to be able to do in the soundscape. And, and I've only done the first book, so... There's a long road of it to come. Um, but when you listen to the prologue, there are piano chords that play for Ileana. And uh, it's a very somber kind of scene there because we as the, as the reader kind of can see that this is not uh, like something terrible has happened. And I love the prologue because it's, it's so well written in the way that we know what's up before uh, Luce Theron does. But anyways, those, these chords that play for Ileana, and those chords are reworked into a kind of arpeggiated thing um, that we hear as a vital part of uh, Elaine's theme that comes the many, 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 many hours I later. Love that. I mean, they do have the same sun hair, the same golden, <laughs> golden hair. Maybe the pattern weaved someone back in. We don't know. Maybe. I I love that theory. I I love all the theories. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there there's a reason that, you know, the innkeeper Matt Hatch got his start on Theoryland and is one of the, you know, premier faces of the Wheel of Time community. Like the, the theories are such a big part of even now, even after the story, uh, even after the story was complete. Like theories are still such a big part of of this experience, and I love it yeah. so much. Yeah. yeah, it's just nice to I put little Easter eggs in there that hint towards things like that, and uh, you can maybe take it that way or not. Uh, it's a lot of fun for sure. I love it. Perfect. All right. So should we have Tarman's Gap play us out? Let's do this. Sounds All good right. to me. Terrible heat. Crackling heat. From the clear sky, lightning came. Each bolt crisp and sharp, 
searing his eyes, each bolt striking a winged black shape. Hunting cries became shrieks of death, and charred forms fell to leave the sky clean again. The heat. The terrible heat of a light. He fell to his knees. He thought he could hear his tears sizzling on his cheeks. No! He clutched at tufts of wiry grass for some hold on reality. The grass burst in flame. Please, no! The wind rose with his voice, howled with his voice, roared with his voice down the pass, whipping the flames to a wall of fire that sped away from him and toward the Trolloc host faster than a horse could run. Fire burned into the Trollocs, and the mountains trembled with their screams. Screams almost as loud as the wind and his voice. It has to end! He beat at the ground with his fist, and the earth told like a gong. He bruised his hands on stony soil, and the earth trembled. Ripples ran through the ground ahead of him in ever-rising waves. Waves of dirt and rock towering over Trollocs and Fades, breaking over them as the mountains shattered under their hooved feet. A boiling mass of flesh and rubble churned across the Trolloc army. What was left standing was still a mighty host, but now no more than twice the human army in numbers, and milling in fright and confusion. The wind died. The screams died. The earth was still. Dust and smoke swirled back down the pass to surround him. The light blinds you, Balsaman. This has to end. It is not here. It was.